So I'm going to begin with this picture of me. Uh, what is it like to be a scientist? Now, actually, it's one of the great privileges of life to be a scientist. So you're probably thinking, why have I got such a grumpy expression on my face? And the reason is this. Many universities around the world make scientists feel uh, like this polar bear, right? <laughs> now, I'm not complaining about the way they heat the buildings. That's all right. What I mean is this. They'll take a scientist, and for example, they will put them in a physics department and expect them to stay there. So that scientist can look out at all the other departments on the horizon, but there's no meaningful way of collaborating with them. And this idea is infiltrated through society to the extent that it's even got a name. It's called the art science divide. The idea that you are either from the arts and humanities or you're from the sciences, but you can't be both. Now, I know from personal experience that that's not true because I have a degree in science, but I also have a degree in art as well. And I bet many of you are talented at more than one thing, so why shouldn't you be allowed to do more than one thing? So through my career, I've been sort of really determined to defeat the art-science divide. I remember going uh, on a holiday to Brazil, and there's a town called Manaus, and in Manaus, two huge rivers come together. And as a tourist, you can catch a boat to the very confluence of the rivers. And you can look down. And I remember seeing all of these amazing swirls of water and thinking, this is where all of the cool stuff happens, right where the two rivers come together. Now, the arts and sciences are like two huge rivers. So how do you get them to flow into each other? And of course, the answer is fairly straightforward. You've just got to find a common point of gravity something that both people from the arts and science find interesting. So that's why in my career, I actually started to get more and more interested in nature's patterns, because surely everybody is interested in nature's patterns. Now take a look at this. This is the dried surface of an old potato. Now, isn't it amazing how something so mundane can look so visually striking? But there's more. Take a look at this. These are the neurons in your brain. So this is the circuit that allows you to think. Now, I don't know about you, but aren't you worried about how close these look? <laughs> now, for me, it certainly explains why some days, you know, I feel like I've got an old potato up there. But think about the more general message. What it's saying is that you can take patterns from quite diverse systems in nature and they look like each other. And the reason why is that many of nature's patterns are built from branches. We just look at a few examples. Rivers have got lots of branches in them. Lightning has got branches in them. Right? Branches have got branches in them. So my career has gravitated towards something called biomimicry. And what that means is learning from nature's patterns where you take what you learn and you apply it to a man-made system. Now that, of course, can be applied through many, many different disciplines. And that's why I've been lucky to arrive at the University of Oregon, because they've given me positions not just in physics, but in psychology and the art department as well. Now, this is where you are. This is a, a map of campus. And what I want to do is just take you on a few of my sort of collaborative journeys over the last 10 years when I've been here. And I want to start off with a a collaboration between physics and chemistry, where we're building these branch patterns out of metal. And what we want to do is take those, and we want to put them in solar panels. Now, of course, leaving aside Richard's point about how you use solar, of course, solar energy, in one sense, is great because you get the energy for free. The problem with today's solar panels is they're not that efficient at gathering all of that energy and converting it into electricity. Now, so where is the problem with today's solar panels? Well, have you ever looked at these things and wonder why they're shaped the way that they are? Because nature's great solar collectors don't look like that. They're branched, and because they're branched, they generate an enormous surface area to collect all of that solar energy. So what we're doing is building these branched patterns into solar panels to improve their efficiency. And we're going to apply those to rooftops, but we're also going to put them in these little electronic chips. And the idea is that in the future, we'll hand those chips over to a surgeon, and they will put them in the back of the human eye. 
Now, you know, you're probably going, whoa, where did that come from? But of course, the back of your eye, the thing called the retina, is just like a natural solar panel. It receives light, converts it into electricity, and then your nerves pass that signal onto the brain so that you can see. Now, the problem is, is that across the world, literally millions of people each year get di diagnosed with diseases of the retina, such as macular degeneration, and that wipes out your natural solar panels and you start to lose vision. So the idea is that we're going to develop these chips so that the, the surgeon can go in and replace that damaged natural solar panel. The challenge of doing that is how do we wire up the chips so that they can pass the signal onto the nerves, onto the brain. Now, no great surprise, the nerves in your retina, because they're natural, are branched. So what we're doing is growing these little branch structures onto the chips so when they get put in the eye, people will be able to see again. And these, these uh, sort of things are already at human clinical trials. And we're going to develop these things, not just for human vision, but for these guys as well, these little robots. So in a couple of generations' time, maybe even your grandchildren might have these guys as their servants, or maybe even as your grandchildren's best friends, whatever. Whatever role they're going to play in society, they're going to be able, they must be able to see to fulfill that function. So I think you can kind of see that the, the sort of concept of biomimicry has got a really bright future in science. What I want to do is switch gears and ask the same of the art world. Has any artist succeeded in biomimicry by painting these natural branch structures? And I want you to consider this guy, a famous American artist painting at his peak in the 1950s, Jackson Pollock. And he had this unusual technique of pouring paint directly on the canvas. Now, you might say that's unusual, but today his paintings are worth more than any other artist. Each of his paintings are valued anywhere up to $600 million. It's quite remarkable. Now, what we've done is we've used computers to compare his painted branch patterns to the branch patterns in nature, for example, in forests. And they are exactly the same. He's managed to replicate nature precisely. And that is really good news, because in addition to the genuine Pollocks out there, there are hundreds and hundreds of fakes. And whereas the real Pollocks can replicate nature with precision, the fakes can't. So we're using computers to distinguish the real Pollocks, the masterworks, from the fakes. That saves museums hundreds of millions of dollars, and it also protects the legacy of this great American national treasure. Now, of course, the big question is, what was it about this guy that he could actually replicate these natural patterns so well. And if you look at his style, it must be something to do with his, his body motions. So in a collaboration with the human physiology department, we've been analyzing the way people move when they paint. And I think this project is a great demonstration of how to defeat the art-science divide. Because on the one hand, our results are telling us something about the art of this great painter. But on the other, it's telling us something about the science of human balance. Now, of course, the multi-million dollar question is why are his paintings worth so much? Could it be that people are willing to pay that staggering amount of money because of the way they look? Have they got some sort of magic visual appeal? So to answer that question, I've been collaborating with psychologists, examining how people react when you show them these natural branch patterns. So for example, in this experiment, we'll put an image of the branches on a monitor, and then a little camera underneath will look at the, where the person's eye and where they've been looking. So that red trajectory is where the person has been looking when they've been looking at a natural pattern. It turns out that your eyes are incredibly efficient at sifting through all the visual information of nature's patterns. But what's more staggering is what's happening to the rest of your body when you're looking at these, at these natural patterns. Your whole physiology changes, in particular your stress levels, plummet by up to 60%, which is an enormous amount. So using techniques such as the MRI facility in the new Lewis Center, we're actually looking at what's happening to people's brains when they're looking at these natural patterns. And it really does appear 
that your brain is actually fundamentally wired to appreciate natural patterns. Now, the initial studies were sponsored by NASA because they wanted to keep the stress levels of astronauts low. But, you know, what about the rest of us, right? <laughs> America spends, or I should say wastes, $300 billion a year on stress-related illnesses. So what we want to do in the future is work with artists and architects to figure out how to incorporate these stress-reducing fractals into your everyday environments to keep you stress-free. Now, I made a start the other week. I waited until my wife went out, and then I painted the refrigerator. <laughs> and you're probably guessing it was a failed experiment, because when she came back in, when she came back in and found what I'd done, her stress levels went up, not down. <laughs> But we are still married, and she actually does like the patterns on the re refrigerator now. And these patterns are starting to pop up all around the world in architecture. Now, what I find really interesting, though, is that all of these diverse projects that I've been working on actually focus back in and help the original projects. So going back to inserting the chips in the eye, we have to design the chips to make sure that they trigger this stress-reducing mechanism. The other thing is solar panels. Have you ever wondered why they have to look so ugly? And the amazing thing is that they don't. We've got grants where we're designing solar panels that increase the efficiency of them from an electrical point of view, but they will also reduce your stress levels when you look at them. So I want to go back to the map, and I want to trace out the physical journeys that we've just been on. So there's my home in the physics department. And these are the various collaborations that I've just been describing to you. And I think you can see where we're going. It's actually, <laughs> well, I know where you are. You're somewhere over here. But can you see what's going on here? It actually seems to be tracing out a natural branched pattern. So what about this? What if this is what's going on? But when you're out there exploring all of your interests, what if that is fundamentally a natural process and that you're tracing out, therefore, a natural pattern? And what if that process actually looks after you? So just when it's getting all too spread out and diverse, what if the process feeds back in and focuses in on one of your newfound interests? Now, if that's true, if your explorations of what you're interested in and creativity if that's a natural process, it's very, very clear what perhaps the biggest thing that a university can be doing is creating an environment that encourages that natural process, not just for all of us professors exploring our research, but for students exploring, exploring their education. So this university is actually well known for all of its interdisciplinary activities. That's one of the reasons why I came here. But wouldn't it be amazing if one of its future legacies was that it became internationally renowned for actually being the first university to truly defeat the art-science divide. So thank you for uh, staying with me on all of those journeys. <laughs>